You're watching Pathbreakers with me, Neha Bhotra. Dalmi Group was a pioneer in the cement industry. On this episode, I'm joined by the second and third generation of the family business, Yaduhari Dalmiya and his son, Puneet Dalmiya. The father-son duo takes me through what it takes to carry a rich family legacy forward while adapting to changing market dynamics. I began by asking Yaduhari Dalmiya how the cement sector has evolved since the days of license raj. He had some interesting anecdotes to share. Sir, I'm very grateful for your time. I want to start by asking you about how the business landscape has changed when you took over as a second generation entrepreneur. The government controlled pretty much sales, distribution. How did you do business? I joined business in 1969. At that time, the industry was a completely controlled industry. The only thing that you could do was to cut your cost. And even in cutting the cost, see, power price was controlled. So there could be nothing that you can do on the purchase side. Coal prices were controlled, rail freight. These are the three major costs in cement. So you had no control over them. So only thing which you could save was by having your operational efficiency. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I think my father was an exceptional person. Although he was not educated, he knew even nets and bolts of the cement industry. So at that time, all the pricing was fixed based on Bureau of Industrial Cost and Pricing. They will study the costing of each unit and allow you to make only very small amount of profits. Practically no investment was coming in cement. I think it was Mr. L.K. Jha. He was uh, chairman of Economic Administrative Reforms Commission. He came to our institute and he said all key industries in the country, whether it is steel, whether it is cement, whether it is power, everything is under control and there are no uh, adequate resource generation. How is it that even as a Chartered Accountant Institute, you people have not taken up this with the government. So it was his initiative. Industry started taking up these things with the government. And then he was instrumental in gradually decontrolling all the industries. Mm -hmm. You come from a storied family of entrepreneurs and a legacy family business. Um, as a young adult, what are some memories you have of the first generation actually laying the foundation of the Dalmia group? I think my uncle, he made a lot of, he just, it was just luck that he got a lottery and he got a very good amount. Lottery not in that sense, but he used to do a little bit of what you call this, um, Speculation. Okay. So silver speculation, he made a lot of money and so after that he wanted to invest it in industry rather than continue to do all that. So they decided to go into cement. At that time ACC was the only company which was making cement in India. And they had plants all over. The so my uncle decided ki if we put up a plant only in one area, ACC can crush you in the competition because they will cut the prices there, but then make money in the other zones. So if we want to compete with ACC, it was a very strategic decision at that time. He said, we must put plant in all the four regions. So simultaneously, four plants were put, one in south, one in north, one in east, and like that, so that you could compete. And at one time, there was a very fierce competition between ACC and Dalmias, and both were losing money. If my memory is right, I think it was Mr. Jugal Kishorji Birla who stepped in and he says, Kibi, why should you? I mean, this is a time when India is becoming just independent and so much of opportunities are there for industries to grow. Why should you cut each other's throat, come to a thing and use that money for growth of the, of the country? Mm -hmm. So that is how that whole price war stopped. Also, there was some exposure to banks and uh, insurance as well. I don't have full knowledge about that, but I do, I do know that uh, uh, at that time, uncle, he didn't want to go into only one industry. So he diversified his portfolio. He went into bank, he went into insurance, he went to sugar, he went to engineering. In 1948, when the partition took place within the family, so at that time, we got mainly this cement, refractory and sugar. You mentioned how acquisition in 2004 gave a totally different uh, texture to your cement business. As luck would have it, just when we completed our, our this uh, expansion, brownfield expansion at Dalinapuram, it got completed in March 2004. And the market changed. <laughs> you will not believe that. Uh, I still have a paper, you know, where we put up the paper before the board. 
कि ओके वॉट सॉट ऑफ रिटर्न यू एक्सपेक्ट ऑन दिस इन्वेस्टमेंट इट वॉज जस्ट नॉर्मल रिटर्न इन द थ्री ईयर्स टू थाउजेंड फाइव सिक्स सेवन इट वॉज अनइमेजिनेबल विच वॉज बियॉन्ड एक्सपेक्टेशन सो दैट यू विल कॉल इट ओनली एज ए लक आई डोंट थिंक एनी बडी कैन से कि नो यू मेड ए स्ट्रेटेजिक इन्वेस्टमेंट थिंकिंग दैट यू विल getting such uh, windfall profits today dalmia cement is the fourth largest cement player in the country how do you feel about the transformation a lot of which has been uh, brought about by your son puneet <sighs> frankly as i told you at that time internal generation were not very high and frankly we were not as enterprising also as he, he is mm-hmm. but once that money came from that expansion he was bold to step out and he ordered actually at one time he ordered four plants simultaneously but then we discussed and decided ki we see without having a mining lease to go for such an investment and placing orders with the machinery suppliers can be risky because mining lease itself is a issue which sometimes you may get you may, you may, you may not get. so then actually wherever we were have holding the mining leases we went ahead with two plants and two plants actually we surrendered i think that was a, also a very good move so he was one of the first who started this jobshead.com which was one of the first dot com companies in india and now we'll take the story forward with puneet dalmia we'll speak to him about what it takes to make a company that was not a leader in the cement space the country's fourth largest player stay tuned to Forbes India Pathbreakers thank you so much puneet for joining us on pathbreakers uh, let me jump right in did you always want to join the family business was that always at the back of your mind so when i was doing my mba i was thinking of joining mckinsey so i went and spoke to a few mckinsey partners and one of the partners told me that uh, there are two dimensions on which you should think about before you take a decision one was ability to make impact and the second was personal freedom and he said that uh, if you join your family business on both these dimensions it's a high and if you join mckinsey both these dimensions you rank a low that got me thinking and i thought uh, yes uh, you know maybe i should you know join the family business so what was it like i mean walking into a family business uh, where of course things are set in stone one hand uh, you certainly get a lot of uh, power and influence uh, because you come from a family which controls a large part of the shareholding on the other hand since you are new and young and it's a successful company you have to prove yourself you know everybody who who's there knows more than you or at least they think no more than you um and i think when we come in we are uh, you know we are young we are want to change the world and you know we can see things that have to be changed and it's not easy to enroll people on why things need to change because people have been successful and there is a formula for success and if you come and challenge the status quo without much credibility it is not a easy path so i think you have to earn credibility mm-hmm. but i think you have to take your chances some things you have to drive with conviction and some things you have to enroll people and you know uh, carry them along but if you can't carry everybody along on something you have to take some risks and still you know continue to drive was there at any point a phase where you had to prove yourself to be taken seriously by the family yes i think um, from 97 to 99 i played a role on in sales and marketing and after that i realized that we are a very small company very efficient very profitable we were probably number 20th in india something like that so i told the family council and my father that we should expand uh, it's a brownfield expansion same markets and it will not be very high risk because brand is established distribution network is there a project execution is not that difficult because it's the same location and then he asked me that how much money it will cost and uh, at that time 99 it was 500 crores so it was a lot of money and he asked me who's going to do this project so i said i'll do this project then at that time he told me puneet i can't put 500 crores behind you i asked him why and he said because you don't have credibility so i was a little taken aback by the frankness of the conversation but i thought it was the right conversation you know um and i said okay so what do i need to do to earn credibility and he was very generous he said i am going to give you 2 crores of my personal money uh you take it do something and demonstrate it to me so then i quit the family business and started a dot com company called jobshead.com with a friend of mine 
uh, who was my senior at IIT Delhi and we co-founded the company and gave us a tremendous experience. We raised capital, we went through ups and downs, uh, you know, we had to pivot uh, in terms of uh, starting revenue very quickly. Uh, there was competition, there was local competition, global competition, competition from traditional media. And I think once we sold Jobs Ed in 2004, it gave me a lot of confidence. It shaped me as a leader. And I think it gave uh, me a lot of credibility uh, in the company. It was a modest outcome. Uh, we sold it for 40 crores. So it was not a, like a great outcome. But at the same time, at least we didn't lose money. And I want to give two, two big things that I learned. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that I learned was that things will go up and down. And when things go bad, at that time, leaders should take accountability. The second big lesson that I learned in Jobs Ahead was, you should not get scared of multinationals and companies with a lot of money. You know? So when Monster and Times of India entered this market in 2004, we were scared. So we sold the company to Monster at 40 crores, six times earnings. In 2007, you know, Nokri.com went public at like 100 times earnings, yeah. you know. What I learned was actually agility and innovation mm -hmm. is what wins in the marketplace. It's not money and resources and, you know, a big footprint. So I think, again, we applied this in Jobs Ahead, uh, in, in Dalmia. Uh, we were a small company, 1 million tons. There were competitors who were much bigger than us. Uh, global companies, Indian companies. We've been very fortunate. We scaled up the company and, um, uh, you know, we've been, we, we made big bold bets. Mm -hmm. So You are now the fourth largest cement company in India. We are the fourth largest. We were like 1 million tons in 2004. Uh, now we are, you know, 40 million tons. Our plan is to go to 100 million by uh, 2031. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we have a lot more confidence. We have a lot more resources. And, um, you know, we have a great team and some very, very, you know, powerful positions in the market. In one of the conversations, uh, you mentioned that there is a need to have a professional setup and there's also a need to preserve traditional values. How have you managed to do it? Because as you pointed out, family hinges a lot on love, a lot on equality, but a uh, business, you have to prove yourself. You're absolutely right. Uh, you know, family and business are two very different ecosystems where different things are valued. In a family, love, equality, empathy, sensitivity. In a business, meritocracy, profits, accountability, results. I think if you can combine these two different ecosystems, you know, you can really create magic. But if you are unable to leverage the, uh, you know, contradictions in this, these two systems, it can create an explosion and it can actually create big problems. So I would just say that uh, you know, we worked really hard to think through how can we create a business uh, ecosystem where family members are treated as professionals and professionals are treated as family members. So if there are professionals, you allow them to take risks, give them more freedom, just like you would give a family member. Mm -hmm. And if they make mistakes, accept it. At the same time, give them love and care for a family member. Love and care to hota hai, you know. But at the same time, you know, you look at who has what skills. And how can you leverage each person's skills in the best possible way? So I will again give you an example how we applied it. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we wrote a constitution, family constitution, where we said we are four people. My, uh, my Tauji, my father, my elder brother and me. We are four people in the family council. Sure. We said four people bring four different skill sets. So let us look at how we can leverage these four skill sets. And I'll give you one example. So we had maybe 30, 40 types of decisions which would go to, which would go at the shareholder level mm -hmm. and some decisions would go at the uh, operating management level. For family compensation, we wanted to run the business like a capitalist, but a family like a socialist. Mm -hmm. So we gave my Tauji, who's my uncle, the large, who's the eldest in the family, the casting vote. So if it's too all, my uncle would decide how to, you know, do the family compensation. Mm -hmm. And if he's being too traditional, world has changed, move forward, then I think three people can overrule him. So I think we leveraged the skill sets of each family member to get the best result. Mm -hmm. And similarly, when we look at professionals, I think we empowered them, we trusted them, we encouraged them to think long term. And I think this creates a, a you know, very good harmonious environment where people can have a performance oriented culture and a caring culture. Tell me 
bit about what really went into framing the strategy for the cement business specifically. There were so many MNCs, there were the cement giants. So how did you begin the process of expanding your market share? Our company was very profitable. We had a very strong balance sheet, great cash flows, uh, no debt. Uh, but I think we did not have the vision to scale up quickly. So I think what we needed to infuse at that time was an ambition to build a bigger business. And I think that meant taking some risks. So I think the first issue was that all the people, you know, who had worked here and been super successful, you know, they had a certain formula which made it successful. When I told them that, look, we have to scale 10x in five years. So this is 2004. Most people didn't believe it. Mm -hmm. So I think I realized that we have to blend this, you know, a talent pool with some new talent, you know. And when we got new talent, there was a huge issue because they were paid much higher. We got people from Vedanta, some people from Pepsi. So they were different companies and they were like, the pay scales were very different from what our people were paid. So uske karan internally bhoot problem hoa. And we had to navigate that for two, three years. There were a lot of attrition. Mm -hmm. But I think we got very lucky. Our first expansion in 2004, it was the same 500 crore project in 1999, okay. which we had pitched. We got very lucky. We started that. In 2006 and 7, it, it started. And at that time, uh, you know, there were two big acquisitions. Holsim acquired ACC and Ambuja. Aditya Birla Group acquired LNT. And because of the consolidation, prices went up. And we also got volume mm -hmm. because nobody was expanding at that time in the market. So both volume and price we got. And us project ka do saal ka payback tha. So the literally complexion of the company changed completely. So our, our EBITDA, which was maybe... 40, 50 crores suddenly became 300, 350 crores. So that was one step which really changed the fortunes of the company. And then I think we again expanded. Uh, we built two more plants, one in Andhra Pradesh and one in Tamil Nadu. And again, you know, that led to, you know, further expansion. Then we invited KKR in 2010. So till from 2004 to 2010, it was all organic growth. But from 2010 to 2015, 16, it was all mergers and acquisitions. And I think when KKR, and KKR was the catalyst, yeah. how did that partnership uh, change things? If you can share some anecdotes about what they brought to the table, which kind of helped you to really accelerate. It was the amazing. I think, you know, um, Henry Kravis, who is the co-founder of KKR, asked me a question uh, before investing uh, that, Puneet, what do you want from me other than my money? <laughs> so I told him, Henry, I want your time. And uh, you are also a shareholder. We are shareholders. I think you can bring a perspective that we don't have. You have seen companies across the world in different geographies at different stages of maturity. And I think we can learn a lot from, from that wisdom and experience. So he told me, be careful what you ask for. You may get it and you may regret it. Because I'm a very hard, you know, taskmaster. I give very, you know, blunt feedback and you may not like it. What was the first blunt feedback he gave you? So I think he told me, <laughs> The first thing he told me, Puneet, bad news should take the escalator. Good news can take the stairs. So he says, you have to build confidence and trust in this partnership. I want to hear from you. If anything is going wrong, just pick up the phone and call me. You know, and he says, I don't want to hear from anybody else. I think it was a great feedback. Second thing he told me, he said, this is a commodity business. You know, do not take too much debt and make sure you manage risk well. And I think it was great interacting with him. Joe Bay, you know, who's the uh, president now, Sanjay Nair. Uh, Sanjay was on our board, um, uh, Rupen Javeri. Uh, so I think all these people really helped us bring a lot of discipline in our financial planning mm -hmm. and also in our m and process. Uh, we learned a lot from them and I think uh, really that, that partnership was a defining moment for Dalmia. Uh, we had zero track record of doing acquisitions. Exactly. But because of KKR, mm -hmm. we got a lot of deal flow. We did five acquisitions during those five years. Mm -hmm. And I think that again really transformed the uh, company. And I think what it took us What did you learn about due diligence from KKR? They are at the front of the game when it comes to m &A. So what are one or two things that you learned from them? Two things. One, they said you should have two teams whenever you're doing m &A. One which argues for the case, one which argues against the case. So you know the one which argues for the case tells you all the opportunities. Mm -hmm. And the one which argues against the case can tell you all the risks. And then you can sit down and figure out how to mitigate those risks. And which risks are you willing to take, which risks you're not willing to take. So don't get emotionally attached to a deal. You know, look at opportunities and risks in a very balanced way and then take a decision. Second was 
you know, just really a phenomenal rigor in diligence. So they do diligence of like, of course, all kinds, financial, legal, people, etc. And more than this, they said you should come up with a 100 day plan for every acquisition that you make. So there should be a clear action steps. These are the five things I'm going to do. And this is the outcome that I expect in 100 days. So there should be visible change in 100 days. I think this was pivotal when you picked up many of the distressed assets following the entire IBC proceedings, uh, 2017, 2018. Tell us a bit about what led you to choose these assets and how did it fit in with your strategy of expanding market share? We wanted to be diversified across multiple regions. So we looked at assets which could help us with diversification and some assets could be a very good fit in our existing portfolio and we could get synergies. So, so, for example, we picked up an asset in Kalyanpur, which is in Bihar. And uh, we used to supply to Bihar from Odisha, which was too far away. And because we had a plant in Kalyanpur, it was a small plant, but at least we had a footprint there, which could help us save our logistics cost. There was an asset in uh, uh, Maharashtra, which was Murli, which was a uh, new region for us. It was partly diversification and partly it was, you know, deepening your footprint in the same region and extracting synergies. I think IBC uh, acquisitions actually help you accelerate your business plan, you know, because if you do all greenfield, it takes two years to build a plant, sure. then you do and if it's a greenfield, it may take longer, then it takes time to, you know, build distribution. But if you acquire a running business, you can do plug and play and it shortens your gestation period to market. Yes, you have to pay a premium to accelerate your plan. Uh, so I think that's fine. But in case of IBC assets, actually you are able to accelerate your plan at a discount. So I will see But it assets. requires additional capex as well, considering that many of these plants would not be in a very good condition, like Murli Industries, for yes. example. It required a significant amount of reinvestment just to bring it up to running order, which took about one and a half, two years, I think. Uh, absolutely. So I think, uh, you know, Murli was a, a deal where our entry price was very attractive. And I think we had factored in the additional capex, which will be required. Uh, to bring it up to shape and yes, Murli took a little longer because it was not a running plant and also it had a prolonged litigation also. So yes, it, it did take some time. Also Binani Cement, uh, I do remember that that was one asset where you actually had the highest bid and yet following legal proceedings, etc., a third player came in to the fray and they actually won the assets. Did that set back uh, your plans a bit? Look, I mean, we definitely wanted to diversify into North India. And Binani was an asset which would have given us an attractive entry into North India. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, at that time, the uh, IBC code was still evolving. And I think the Supreme Court took a view and uh, that uh, value maximization is more important than, uh, you know, process sanctity, the initial bid. And we respect that view. So, yes, it, uh, it did not uh, give us the entry into North India, which we uh, desperately wanted. Uh, but that's okay. You win some, you lose some. And uh, we continue to expand, uh, you know, our, our footprint uh, across India and it was not meant to be and we have accepted it and moved on. North and West are two regions where you actually want to ramp up. How are you strategizing your plans in terms of increasing your footprint in that region? So South uh, and East are our two large markets. We have a small presence in West uh, through Murli uh, and also uh, through our plant in uh, Belgaon which sells into Western Maharashtra. Uh, we are in the process of acquiring uh, JP's assets in Central India, which is Madhya Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh. Uh, and we have uh, signed a deal. It is uh, a complicated process because there are many banks and there are multiple businesses. So I think they have to find a full solution to this. We are trying to do that transaction uh, and uh, expand our business across these. So at least the only region which will be missing largely is the North and a little bit of West. Um, but I think, uh, you know, we have still seven, eight years to, you know, build up Pan India strategy and we'll continue to be on the lookout. We have some mining leases mm -hmm. and um, if we can get some acquisition at the right time, at the right price, great. If we can't, we will build our own plants. Mm -hmm. How do you see the cement space evolving and changing the dynamics of the industry? I think India is a large market and India will be a market which will continue to grow for the next uh, foreseeable future. So I expect demand to be reasonably strong. At the same time, I think, um, you know, there is a lot of optimism about the future. 
and when there is optimism a lot of people invest and typically there is over investment yes uh, so i think even now industry is running at 70% utilization there is a high probability that there will be over investment and um, the supply will outstrip demand you know so i feel that there could be a time when you know utilization levels will go low in the industry and um, if the demand doesn't you know uh, keep pace with the way we have forecasted it there could be a short period of time it's hard to forecast exactly uh, when it will happen how long it will stay etc there is likely to be consolidation because the top four players are going to grow faster than the industry and they will uh, have the ability to either build new capacity faster or acquire capacity based on multiple scenarios some people may see cement as non core some people uh, you know may want to exit due to distress etc so there will be a variety of factors because of which i believe there will be consolidation so i think um, people who want to play cement should play it with a long term view uh, it is not a straight road to paradise it's a bumpy road and uh, it's a low margin business uh, right now margins are at a 20 year low so in short term i think we are facing headwinds uh, but uh, if you have the appetite and the stomach to ride the roller coaster and to ride this cycle um, uh, i think then you know there is there is a very attractive sector to be in it is a domestic business there is a large domestic market uh, there are no import threats and it's a um, it's a you know product which requires uh, efficiency uh, and um, you know good distribution but i believe that consolidation will happen and the demand supply thing may not be uh, you know perfect as it is sometimes you know, forecast we want to build a you know business which is uh, you know sustainable which is predictable and which has scale so i think we have guided the market that we will try to build a company with 110 to 130 million tons in capacity by 2031 Mm-hmm. how do you see the pecking order change in the cement industry i think it's hard to forecast because uh, everybody uh, wants to grow ultratech is the number one company in cement yes i think they have plans to go to 200 million tons and um, i think uh, they are a company which we admire and respect adani has come in they have announced plan to go to 140 million uh, they have a exceptional track record of execution across all businesses they have built you know great assets in india which are very hard to execute ports roads power plants renewable energy etc so i'm sure you know you know they will they will do a great job in execution shri cement again terrific you know track record in execution building new plants they have not done mna so far but they have said that they are open to mna uh, and i think uh, you know they will grow uh, they are the lowest cost producer done a great job i think we will grow then jsw jsw also wants to grow in this sector and they have announced plans to go to 50 million So I think there are four or five players who have like really serious plans and a good management team and a, a track record to execute. Now, how will things change? It's hard to forecast, and um, I think um, it's not a winner takes all business. This is a business where you you know sink and swim together, and if prices fall, it affects everybody. Uh, it may affect some people who have more debt much more severely, and if you have a strong balance sheet, I think you can survive in this business. Broadly, you know the. uh top 4 5 players uh, seem like you know it is going to be these ones that have but you know who knows they could be you know some uh, people who can be more aggressive or want to take more risk and we will see so you know the kind of debt adani has on its books mm-hmm. do you think that will open up opportunities for the other three cement players i think their cement balance sheet is very very strong and i think if you look at ambuja cement it has zero debt it has net cash and uh, it has a great cash flow so i would say that financing the expansion which they have announced is not at all difficult you know and i think they have a, a exceptional track record of executing you know very tough projects they have great brands they have a great team and i think uh, you know with karan adani who is now uh, leading the cement business they have a young focused entrepreneur uh, you know who is uh, you know very sharp and you know we have a lot of admiration and respect for them overall when you look at the sector per se not just dalmia cement how do you think they will have to fine tune their uh, manufacturing capacities etc considering the entire onus on esg the focus on greener and cleaner use of energy i do know that you have a vision to be 
carbon negative by 2030. Tell us a bit more about that. I think this is the most important question in the cement business. Mm. Cement, as you know, uh, generates uh, around 7% of the world's CO2. And how do you ensure that you grow in an eco-friendly manner um, is a very, very important question. First of all, we are proud that we are one of the greenest cement companies in the world. And if I look at our carbon footprint, it is uh, you know about 30% lower than the world average and 15% lower than India's average uh, carbon footprint. So I think we are very proud of that. Um, we also think that uh, you know, there are two areas where there is a lot of visibility on how to reduce the carbon footprint. One is moving from fossil fuels to alternate fuels. And the second is to move from thermal energy to renewable energy. All companies are going on this roadmap. The unknown today is how do you reduce the carbon footprint in calcination, which is the main process. You burn limestone and when you burn limestone, carbon dioxide comes out. Globally, the many governments are giving subsidies for carbon capture. These are very expensive investments, uh, $500 million, a billion dollars to capture carbon and sequester it in the ground or potentially, you know, sell it. I think in India, this is not going to happen. You know, so I think we cannot expect and neither do I encourage this that you should take, you take subsidies from the government for capturing carbon. It's our job to be responsible. You know, we can't load this on the uh, you know, on the Indian government or the Indian taxpayer. Mm -hmm. There are some innovations which are going on. Okay. None of them are uh, commercially scalable as of now. So one, we are keeping a track on what are the new technologies that are coming up in this space where we can think of, uh, you know, lowering the carbon footprint in calcination. And I think the second thing is, can you do a natural carbon sink? Can you plant lots of trees and ensure that they survive and they create a natural carbon sink? I think that could potentially be viable if you do it in wastelands of the government. So we are studying that and we, we are seeing that whether instead of investing hundreds of millions of dollars in carbon capture, you know, can you do a natural sink? But it's still early days. I think uh, this will evolve and it has to be done in a manner which doesn't kill your business model. Tell me a bit about what keeps you busy outside the boardroom. <laughs> I'm very fond of yoga and meditation. I start my day with yoga and meditation every day. Uh, and then I go for a walk with my wife. My morning starts with a very uh, regimented, uh, you know, routine. Uh, and I think it's good to just, you know, give time to your body and your mind to just relax. Keeps you fit throughout the day. I'm a very positive person. I think that, uh, you know, whatever happens is a learning experience. Sometimes things are good, sometimes things are bad. But uh, when things are good, you should not get arrogant. When things are bad, you should not get depressed. So I try to maintain equanimity. And I take life like that. I try to live in the present moment. I don't worry too much about the future. I try to accept people as they are rather than try to fix them. Apart from, um, you know, business, I'm involved in education. Um, you know, Ashoka is an institute which uh, some of my friends started. Ashish Dhawan. He was uh, also the first investor at Jobs. He was the first <laughs> investor in Jobs. Now, I'm the chairman of I am Raipur. Uh, and I think that is the institute I want to focus on to give direction to it and work with the director and the faculty members to really position it as one of the most, you know, respected and world-class management institutes in the next, uh, you know, five to ten years. Education is an area which is very close to my heart. Uh, the second area that we really like is uh, India's soft power. Um, and I think uh, India has a lot to offer to the world. Uh, it is just that... Um, you know, we have not marketed our heritage sites in a manner that, that is engaging to the youth. There was an adopt a heritage scheme made by um, the government of India, mm -hmm. Ministry of Culture, in which Dharmya Bharat has adopted Red Fort. Uh, we have uh, created three products there, which are uh, very engaging. One is a product called Matribhumi. It's a laser show on the, uh, you know, ramparts of the Red Fort, which tells the 5,000 year old journey of India as a civilization and how scientifically and spiritually advanced India was. Then we've made a museum inside the Red Fort. And finally, we've created a sound and light show with 70 live actors. It is like a Broadway musical. A first time in a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is called Jai Hind. And uh, it tells the story about India's freedom struggle. You regularly feature on rich lists. Uh, I wonder what being on a rich list means to you. I don't really want to look at these numbers. Um, I really believe Naam Kuch Leke Aaya Naam Kuch Leke Jayenge. 
I think we look at this as a trustee. All the wealth that you generate or all the success, material success that you achieve, a lot of people contribute to it. So I think whatever you earn, a large part of it has to go back to society and it has to go for public good. You know, we don't need too much to sustain ourselves. We believe that we are custodians of wealth. We are fortunate to have received this and we have to use this wealth to do maximum good for people around us and for society. I think that is the best use of money. I do not want to get ever distracted with these numbers, etc. They are all temporary. They are all something which just boosts your ego and it gets people around you, you know, who, you know, prod you up. The company that you need to keep is people who will give you good feedback, who will make you good human beings, who will inspire you, from whom you can learn. And, um, and I think do good with whatever God has bestowed upon you. And I think in, in our country, I have seen there is still so much to be done. Government can do this much. Government is doing a lot. Yes. But the private sector has to come forward, you know, and play its role in, you know, uplifting, you know, people. I'm sure everybody is doing it in your own, in their own way. But can we just multiply this effort faster, bigger, and think beyond ourselves to build, build a great country? I think that is what wealth, you know, means to me. And um, that is what inspires me. It's a, it's a great tool to have. You know, it helps you do a lot of things, but it should be used for good rather than for self-consumption. Mm -hmm. My final question, you are a third generation entrepreneur. Do you have discussions with your children? Do you expect them to take on the mantle, to take the legacy forward? Or would you let them choose what they want to do? This is one responsibility they can take if they're interested. You know, otherwise we want to build an institution which will run without, you know, uh, you know, with process systems and people. Um, so. I would encourage, uh, you know, my children to be good human beings, to be sensitive, you know, responsible citizens of this country and encourage them to do whatever fulfills them. And this is definitely one responsibility, whether they want to be a shareholder, whether they want to be a board member, whether they want to be a manager, that is something which time will tell and their own capability will tell. I don't want to force anything, you know, uh, on anyone, but uh, encourage them to be responsible, happy, fulfilled citizens. Thank you so much for your time. It was great speaking with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.